Good evening, everybody. My name is uh, Hanko Jurgens from the Deutschland Institute, and I'm welcoming you all in this evening on reparation and restitution in Germany, German history, a reassessment. We have had a workshop all day long, so we started at 9.30 already, and actually, Konstantin uh, Goschler uh, is, well, we consider him as the keynote of our workshop, so to speak, but uh, we are very happy that you're all here. And I have a short introduction. One of the most interesting aspects of restitution and reparation in German history is that it seems to be a separate topic which should be studied as a special field, but in reality it is an integrated part of Germany's past, which should be studied interdisciplinary. The history of reparation and restitution has become part of the study of transnational justice, in which the recognition of victims, trust in institutions, and the integration of both former victims and perpetrators in society plays an important role. Transitional justice shows how a society wants to do justice to its past, recognizes its atrocities, recognizes the crimes of perpetrators, and recognizes the victims by paying reparation and restitution. In this way, reparation and restitution has become, become part of cultural memory, since it shows how a society dealt with victimhood, and also which victims were recognized by the state. Interestingly, this changed over time. Recognition of victimhood and an open eye for, the, for past crimes against humanity has become an integral part of German politics. But this was not at all taken for granted. It was a difficult road which Germany had to take after the Second World War with a lot of bumps and obstacles on the way. Interestingly, the study of restitution and reparation also has become part of global history. The first negotiations on compensation and reparation of Jewish victims took place in 1952 in Kasteel oud Wassenaar, here in the Netherlands, between representatives of Israel, Germany, and the New York-based Jewish Claim Conference. Later on, many other claimants asked for justice, from the German ex-police, the Vertriebenen, forced laborers, to the victims of colonial genocide, by which I mean the Herero and Nama, who were massively persecuted and driven into the desert of Oma Heke. And all these debates on restitution and reparation uh, on the, of the descendants of these victims, they are topical up until today. So today we had this small workshop on all these topics, and we are very happy that Konstantin Goschler, uh, who is, well, I, I would say an eminent schooler of all these topics, is here uh, to elaborate on, on the issue. Konstantin Goschler is professor for modern history at the Ruhr Universiteit Bochum, and, and his name uh, is well known in various fields of study. And interestingly, in all those fields, he is somebody who is to be reckoned with. Uh, for example, on the field of intelligence agency, technology and knowledge production, data processing and information transfer in secret services during the Cold War, he published an edited volume, only very recently. But also, on the topic of German unification and the transition of the two German states into one united Germany, he is uh, the editor of uh, the series, what is it, Deutsche Einheit? Or, or, Buch des Deutsche Einheit. Uh, he published various books on the history of science, but he is particularly well known for the topic of today. Among his latest book, books are Compensation in Practice, The Foundation, Remembrance, Responsibility and Future, and the legacy of forced labor during the Third Reich. It's an edited volume as well. Or historical dialogue and the prevention of mass atrocities. Uh, and he also uh, consulted a number of documentary films. Most importantly, The Wings of History, the story of the Luxembourg Agreement in 2022. 
Um, after Konstantin Goschler has given his talk, and we expect he will talk about three quarters of an hour, Lorena de Vita uh, will uh, respond. She is a very promising scholar from Utrecht University who uh, is, uh, has published recently in 2020 a book which is called Israel Politik, German-Israeli Relations. And recently she, had a, she has a, coordinates a very uh, prestigious project on Holocaust diplomacy, the global politics of memory and forgetting, financed by the Alfred Landecker Foundation. And now she is coordinating a new project on the diaries of the judge Otto Kuster, who is strongly involved in reparations and restitution to war crime victims and victims of crimes against humanity by the German government after the Second World War. So I introduce you both, and we are very interested to your talk. <laughs> So that's very kind of you. So I, I need to start with an apology. I was t told that uh, I was expected to present a PowerPoint presentation, and so I'm a very old school German professor, <coughs> and so I will only read and talk, but as a kind of uh, compensation I will offer you, whenever you find that you can understand what I'm saying, just say, please could you explain what you want to say, so please feel free to interrupt me, not too often, but if you really feel the desire, uh, so don't hesitate. Well, um, tonight I would like to share some general thoughts on, on some of the changes that have taken place in the realm of restitution. Restitution is a real huge topic. These changes concern both the subject matter itself and also the academic engagement with it. The history of reparations is not only about actual payments, but also refers to a discursive space to talking about reparations, which aims at future reparations. So the history of reparations is characterized by a, by a paradox. To the extent that any benefits are delivered, unfulfilled claims become visible. And at the same time, Successful reparation claims can also serve as a point of reference for new claims. Scholars of various disciplines have participated in this process in many ways. So in the following minutes, I would like to situate the history of German reparations to victims of Nazi persecution within the wider history of reparations in the 20th and 21st centuries in order to open up a view of the broader significance of this topic. I will argue that since the end of World War I, reparations have slowly shifted from the context of the right of the victor to the context of liberal moral politics. After World War II, this development was epitomized by Holocaust reparations and finally, after the end of the Cold War, in transitional justice. In the last decade, however, the quest for reparations has moved into the context of post-colonial reparations, which at the same time refers to Holocaust reparations and also departs from the premises of liberal moral politics. There, in the post-colonial context, Western liberalism is no longer considered as the goal, but rather as the cause of the problems, which now shall be addressed by reparations. By doing so, post-colonial reparation claims inherit the moral emphasis of the liberal concept of reparations, while at the same time denying its very foundations. So my discussion starts with the Versailles Re Peace Treaty of 1919, which created the modern concept of war reparations. Until then, it had always been the right of the victor to determine what the defeated side has to pay. Basically, these were war tributes, Cartago, which can be found as a very old principle in history. The Versailles Peace Treaty marked a deep cesura. First, it shifted the emphasis on civilians who had been harmed by German military actions. And second, 
even more important, it changed the rationale of reparations from German defeat to German guilt. So the Allies introduced the war guilt clause into the Versailles Peace Treaty, the notorious Article 231, which Jörg Fisch has qualified as moralization of reparations. The result was a combination of drastic reparation demands and moral condemnation, which led to a bitter counter campaign in the German Reich. This was against the background that the German Empire had imposed draconian reparations on both France in 1871 and Russia in the spring of 1918, albeit in the old spirit of the victor's law. Another important result of the peace treaties after 1919 were extensive shifts of borders, which produced numerous ethnic minorities within the newly created nation states. Therefore, the Versailles Peace Treaty also stipulated the protection of national minorities safeguarded by international institutions. This was also the background of a famous legal case which took place at the Permanent Court of International Justice in 1928. The factory at Korsov, Germany versus Poland. The case dealt with a nitrogen factory which had belonged to a German national and which was dispossessed by the Polish state after the war. The court decision introduced a revolutionary departure from thus existing principles of restitution. The case defined reparation as an act, quote, which must as far as possible wipe out all the consequences of the illegal act and reestablish the situation which would in all probability have existed if, if that act had not been committed, unquote. Historian Lindner Kinsler, who has analyzed this case, writes, quote, in effect, Corso provided jurists with a formula for erasing the recent past and replacing it with a more just version of itself, unquote. While the court admitted that this would only be possible partially, nevertheless it profoundly changed what Linda Kinsler called the reparative imagination. However, from the beginning there was some awareness that the law could not serve as some kind of magic salt which might erase all traces of a bad past. From the very beginning, the reparative imagination has always been confronted with the question of the limits of reparations. Hence, already in the interwar period, the first contours of a new reparations regime had been developed. Traditional war reparations slowly shifted in the direction of moral politics. Furthermore, reparative imaginations were introduced in the sphere of international relations that also tended to challenge the limits of state sovereignty. Thus, if we want to understand how a comprehensive program of reparations for the victims of Nazi rule was developed after 1945, we must take into account the expansion of the realm of possibility and imagination that these developments entailed. So I'm coming to my second point, liberal versus socialist reparations during the Cold War. Unlike after the First World War, after the Second World War, the situation was more than clear. The Germans had both started and lost the war, and their crimes were also undisputed, if not yet fully known. The moralization of reparations, which had taken place after the First World War, made it almost indispensable to demand reparations, even if this no longer seemed politically opportune after the bad experience of the Versailles Peace Treaty. But there was another paradigm shift after 1945. Whereas reparations had hitherto been a matter for belligerent nations, they were now extended to individuals and groups who had been victims of Nazi aggression inside and outside Germany. There were three main reasons for that. First, the expulsion of destitute refugees from Nazi Germany to other countries which was at that time considered as export of social problems. 
think to the question of refug refugees today. This was quite a, a similar process. Rightfully, at that time, this was considered as a new weapon of dictatorships. As a consequence, the principle of state immuni immunity was weakened and Germany was made responsible for compensating German expats, mostly Jewish. Nazi politics, and this is my second argument, had produced the sense that attempts for the protection of national minorities by international institutions, which had been in established in the interwar period, were unsuccessful. Among others, this promoted the concept of Jews as a nation and also collective reparation claims. And third, Jewish claims finally were successfully detached from the general context of reparations, war reparations for other countries, by establishing the singularity of the Holocaust, which, to be clear, at that time was not yet labeled in that manner. Important impulses for later efforts to compensate victims of Nazi persecution can thus be identified already before the end of the war. Soon after 1945, however, the issue of reparations for victims of Nazi persecution became part of the Cold War and the East-West confrontation. After World War II, different explanations of the Nazi regime, its perpetrators and its victims, as well as different models of political and social order emerged in West and East Germany. The discourses and practices of reparation and compensation were also shaped by the opposing systems of the Cold War. In the West, the Nazi regime was interpreted as a totalitarian dictatorship. That means as a system of injustice with anti-Semitism at its ideological core. In the East, on the other hand, the term fascism was used, the roots of which were identified primarily in the capitalist economic system. Accordingly, in the West, the Jews were seen as the first victims of Nazism, while in the East, the Russians assumed this role. Thus, while in the West, reparations and compensation were an element of the restoration of a bourgeois liberal social order, in the East, they were subordinated to the goal of establishing a socialist social order under anti-fascist auspices. The differences began with terminology, as reparations meant different things in West and East Germany. In the Soviet occupation zone and since 1949 in the GDR, the word referred to the reparations payments made on a large scale to the Soviet Union and Poland until the mid-1950s. This use of the term reparations in the tradition of the Versailles Peace Treaty after the, uh, this use of the term stood in the tradition of the Versailles Peace Treaty after the First World War, where the term Wiedergutmachung, literally making good again, was used as the German translation for the war reparations stipulated there. In West Germany, however, the term Wiedergutmachung, making good again, no longer referred to interstate war reparations after 1945. In the Federal Republic of Germany, the distinction between individual reparations and interstate reparations has been axiomatic until today. In West Germany, restitution thus became, or Wiedergutmachung thus became, the generic term for payments to individual victims of the Nazi regime who had no other state that could represent their claims. The focus was on the so-called racially, re religiously, and politically persecuted, especially Jews. Initially, the focus was primarily on German victims of National Socialism, many of whom had fled abroad to escape the Nazi regime and never returned. The legal formula into which this principle was cast, the so-called territoriality principle, meant in practice that compensation claims depended on origin. This referred to the traditional German concept of citizenship which was based on dissent. The separation of German and non-German Nazi victims 
was only partially broken for foreign policy reasons during the Cold War. This was the case for the first time when the Federal Republic of Germany agreed upon a reparations agreement with Israel and Jewish Claims Conference in 1952, this already has been mentioned, for which considerable resistance had to be overcome in all countries involved. On the one hand, the territoriality principle, which excluded non-Germans, was reaffirmed in Vassena. But on the other hand, material payments in favor of Jewish refugees from Eastern Europe to the State of Israel were agreed. And Jews from Eastern Europe were allowed to apply for, indem for indemnification under the condition that they had to prove that they had belonged to German culture before the Holocaust in order to be treated on an equal footing with German refugees from Eastern Europe. That's a uh, kind of Kafkaesque situation, of course. A small window for foreign victims of persecution also opened when so-called global agreements were concluded with 12 Western European countries, among them also the Netherlands, in the early 1960s. Non-Jewish Eastern European victims, on the other hand, remained almost completely excluded until the end of the Cold War. In the GDR, on the other hand, the focus was, extended, was on extended social benefits for victims of National Socialism who, according to the principles of social welfare, had to reside in the GDR. In practice, this meant that hardly any Jews were supported. There were hardly any Jews living in the GDR, especially after the anti-Semitic wave in the Eastern Bloc in the early 1950s. In addition, a hierarchy increasingly prevailed according to which the so-called fighters against fascism were symbolically and materially above the victims of, fa of fascism. The former, so the fighters, included mainly communist resistance fighters, the later men mainly Jews. This political hierarchization was countered by a social hierarchization in the Federal Republic of Germany. So in, in, in West Germany, the federal compensation law scaled compensation payments according to the social status that recognized Nazi persecutors had enjoyed prior to their, to their persecution. In essence, the compensation was designed to be socially restorative in that it aimed to restore the previous social status. This also resulted in significant differences in the hierarchy of the persecuted in East and West, which are characteristic of the liberal uh, or socialist concept of reparations. The ideal recipient of extended social benefits in the GDR was therefore a mostly male communist resistance fighter, although this also included former communist participants in the Greek Civil War who later emigrated there. In West Germany, on the other hand, the ideal recipients were mostly Jewish survivors who had emigrated from the German Reich to a safer country before the outbreak of World War II. The reference to the respective social and property systems was particularly evident in the question of the restitution of property looted and confiscated during the Nazi era. This aspect primarily concerned Jewish victims of persecution, but also, for example, trade unions and political parties. The desired stabilization of a bourgeois property system based primarily on the principle of private ownership meant that individual restitution in the Western zones of occupation was a priority for the Western allies. The American military government in particular wanted restitution to be as comprehensive as possible and was prepared to disregard certain principles of the German civil code, such as the protection of so-called bona fide purchasers. This legal intervention, however, provoked fierce German protests. Okay. Pardon? Uh, okay, thank you for the question. Bona fide would mean uh, if I buy something and it's uh, which is stolen, uh, 
and uh, I can claim that I didn't know that it's stolen, then I'm bona fide, bona fide. that's Latin, means a good faith. I bought it in good faith. Yeah, and so the question, so German, so there were sales of Jewish property during uh, the Third Reich, where, where non-Jews were, were buying um, Jewish property, and they said, well, afterwards they said, I, I didn't know that it was a stone, or, or maybe somebody bought it from another person who originally had uh, bought it from a Jewish person, and, and after that uh, he could say, well, I, I didn't buy it from a Jewish person. I didn't buy it from another non-Jewish person. And I didn't know that originally this had been um, Jewish property. And in that case, uh, the German civil code would say, okay, if, if this had taken place bona fide in good faith, uh, that's okay. And so the, the U.S. Uh, military government said, uh-uh, no, this is not okay. And so this was one of the major disputes. Okay, thank you for your question. Okay. Um, okay. Underlying this conflict uh, with, uh, on on the uh, good faith question were differing differing interpretations of Nazi persecution. The Allies assumed that a collective situation of persecution of Jews had arisen in the Third Reich. They therefore defined a cut-off date. So this was uh, the date when the Nuremberg laws were proclaimed, after which any sale of Jewish property during the Nazi era was considered to have been carried out by force. This reasoning was often disputed by the Germans, who argued that civil society had largely continued to function normally under the conditions of Nazi dictatorship. When it came to judging the perpetrators, however, the totalitarian character of the dictatorship tended to be emphasized. So this was a paradox. Since the current non-Jewish owners were personally affected by the restitution proceed, uh, proceedings, this is a difference to compensation where the state was paying, the restitution issue in contrast to individual compensation payments had great social explosive power. This was a direct conflict between two different property claims. Although a large part of the recoverable property looted and confiscated in the German Reich during the Nazi era was legally clarified under the Allied restitution laws, this usually ended with monetary compensation and settlements, so that the change of ownership that had taken place in the Third Reich was ultimately largely confirmed. To a certain extent, this also applied to the GDR. In view of the socialist property revolution, restitution hardly played a role there. And to the extent that property acquired under conditions of persecution during the Third Reich was not socialized, it generally remained in the hands of the, of the subsequent owners, which was particularly true of houses and land. In this way, two different models of restitution and compensation developed in the West and East by the mid-1960s, each characterized by a different relationship to the past and the future. Liberal democracy versus the construction of socialism. In both cases, however, this also served to Marx one's own approach to national socialism as politically and morally superior. This brings me to my third point, fighters as witnesses and forgotten victims. In the GDR, the anti-fascist resistance fighters not only formed a privileged support class to which the mere victims were also materially inferior. At the same time, the, the, they were among the central resources for legitimizing the systems since they personally authenticated the victory of socialism over fascism and the resulting mission. The system of care established for this group therefore served not least to maintain the health of this highly stressed group. For example, they had to appear constantly in school classes as contemporary witnesses. So while Annette Viviorka traced the beginning of the era of the witness back to the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, there is also another track which leads to East Germany. One could almost say that the more the legitimacy of the GDR eroded, the more important the fighters became 
since they personally embodied the state's claim to represent the legacy of anti-fascism. In contrast, the victims only, a rather small group overall, received little attention. Compensation and restitution claims by Jewish victims from abroad were also blocked, not only by the reference to the anti-fascist foundation of their own state, but also by the anti-Zionist orientation of the GDR's foreign policy. In the Federal Republic of Germany, however, a significant discursive shift took place in the 1980s. Since the mid-1960s, restitution had been, uh, Wiedergutmachung, had been regarded in West Germany as a legally closed field that only had to be administered, so to speak. This was symbolized by the name of the last amendment to the Federal Compensation Act of 1965, which now was given the suffix, suffix final law. This was also in the context of the end of the post-war period, which Chancellor Ludwig Erhard had officially proclaimed in his government declaration of 1965. Yet about 15 years later, this consensus on the politics of the past broke down again, and not only the term Wiedergutmachung itself was criticized as an attempt to semantically dispose of Nazi crimes, but also the legal approach associated with West German reparations for Nazi victims. Even in the context of growing criticism to the so far established Wiedergutmachung in the Federal Republic, the debate continued to focus primarily on German Nazi victims. Consequently, the fact that the majority of Nazi victims had been persecuted in the territories occupied by the German Reich remained largely forgotten for the time being, even within the Forgotten Victims campaign, which became prominent in the 1980s. So non-Germans were still disregarded, also non-German Jews, of course. Rather, the focus of this campaign was on groups that were currently still discriminated in the Federal Republic of Germany, with an emphasis on the continuities with their fate under the Nazi regime. The debate about forgotten victims that began in the 1980s can thus also be seen as a first offshoot of the culture of victimization in the Federal Republic, which initially emerged in the context of US civil rights policy and gave the social figure of the victim a new meaning. In the Federal Republic of Germany, the status of the forgotten victim of National Socialism thus became the legitimation for current, for current political demands aimed at overcoming traditional discrimination and, social and aiming for social recognition. In addition, the existing practice of individual compensa compensation now was heavily criticized. The title of a 1988 book by the medical doctor and political activist Christian Pross who spoke in this context of a small war against the victims, became a popular catchphrase. Above all, the bureaucratic and medical examinations associated with the recognition of indemnification pensions were now interpreted as a permanent act of humiliation, with the emerging trauma discourse playing an important role. The practice of Wiedergutmachung was now seen as a permanent re-traumatization of the victims. At that time, no lecture on this topic could do without branding the semantics of this term to make good again as a deliberate mockery of the victims. At the same time, the attempt associated with the German reparations legislation to relate compensation payments to the damage suffered as well as to the former social status was criticized. The liberal emphasis on indemnification according to the previous social status was now contrasted with a new reference. The suffering, not the damage, but the suffering of the victims, which should not be subjected to a capitalist taxonomy. Hence, the reparation discourse shifted from the compensation of past damages to the recognition of suffering. Instead of commodifying the harm suffered by the victims of National Socialism, reparations were to offer lump sum payments for incommensurable suffering, which would also elimin eliminate, eliminate the need for agonizing review procedures to precisely determine individual claims. So this was the paradigm shift in the 1980s. <clears throat> 
discourses and practices of reparation in the GDR and the Federal Republic thus took completely different directions in the decade before German reunification. While in the East, the anti-fascist fighters were mobilized in vain to stabilize the crumbling legitimacy of socialism, in the West, reparations became a field in which a new socio-moral milieu was formed that linked the fight for forgotten victims, above all, with the recognition of previously discriminated minorities in the Federal Republic. On the one hand, this broadened the view of Nazi victims that had previously been inscribed in reparations, but on the other hand, this debate also remained strongly self-referential, caught up in West German navel-gazing, so to speak. The fact that the vast majority of Nazi victims in the territories occupied by the Wehrmacht had been persecuted without being compensated was still largely ignored even in the context of the forgotten victims debate. This brings me to my next point, reparations, symbolic gestures and neoliberalism. The reunification of Germany in 1990 was a major turning point in the debate on reparations for the victims of National Socialism. From then on, the impetus came primarily from the sphere of international relations. With the 2 plus 4 agreement, which the Federal Republic of Germany and the German Democratic Republic concluded with the four victorious powers of World War II, the peace treaty clause of the London Debt Agreement of 1953 which had previously protected the Federal Republic of Germany from reparation claims, as well as cla from claims by foreign victims of National Socialism, now was called into question. Reparation claims from Poland and Greece, for example, continue to flare up and to, and up to this day. While the enlarged Federal Republic until today reject these claims, which are more oriented to, towards traditional interstate reparation claims, Berlin conceded after 1990 for the first time to compensation payments for Nazi victims on the other side of the former Iron Curtain. Initially, the focus was on Jewish Holocaust victims in Eastern Europe, many of whom were now receiving pension payments. While these new compensation payments to Eastern European Jews went largely unnoticed by the public, the issue of compensation for forced laborers of the German war economy attracted widespread international attention. In the 1990s, the Clinton administration launched diplomatic efforts in the US, in the US under the motto, Finishing the Business of the Holocaust. A highlight of this movement was the 1998 Washington Conference on Holocaust-era Assets. At this international conference, the restitution of former Jewish property that had not yet been returned was recognized by numerous states at least as a moral obligation, even if this did not become legally binding. The Washington conference became above all the starting point for efforts to restitute looting art from Jewish property, which I will discuss later. Class action lawsuits in US courts against companies from Germany but also from other European countries, which were trying to expand their business activities in the US at the time and were now accused of having enriched themselves during the Nazi era, also generated effective pressure. As a result, the Foundation Remembrance, Responsibility and Future was established in 2000. Former forced laborers from Eastern Europe received lump sum symbolic payments that were intended to create legal certainty for German companies and recognition for former forced laborers. After the end of the Cold War, compensation for victims, or victims of National Socialism also became an issue in those countries which had been on the eastern side of the Iron Curtain, as I just have tried to explain. The former GDR was a special case in that it was bri primarily brought into line with the standards of the old Federal Republic as part of the transformation that had been taking place since 1990. This referred particularly to the restitution of Jewish property that had been taken away during the Nazi era. However, similar claims were now also being made in Eastern Europe in connection with the reprivatization of state property. Re 
Restitution thus became an aspect of the neoliberal transformation of Eastern Europe, which took place in the 1990s. I need to skip a little bit because time is, is running short. So, uh, to sum up this, this chapter, the radically individualistic concept of property that had been implemented in Eastern Europe subsequently also became the basis for a second wave of restitution in Western Europe, which in many countries we evaluated the result of the first wave of restitution, which had taken place already after 1945. The restitution and reparation of Nazi violence had thus temporarily become a European, if not a global, phenomenon in the 1990s. This brings me to my next chapter, Caritas and Sotheby's. What have these two things to do with each other? Caritas and Sotheby's. Caritas and Sotheby's. Okay, I will explain. At the beginning of the 20th century, a millennium fever of reparations soon subsided. Instead of the victims of a violent past, the consequences of an increasingly violent present or the expectation of future catastrophes increasingly determined the horizon of expectations. Moreover, the increasing distance to the end of the Second World War had ambivalent consequences. On the one hand, the finiteness of human life determined the situation, and so the focus was increasing, increasingly on enabling the last surviving victims of National Socialism to enjoy a dignified old age. After compensation and recognition, Caritas, here it comes, was therefore the third and probably last step. The fact that the Federal Ministry of Finance, which is responsible for restitution, recently made a second attempt to consign this field of work to history uh, also fit, fits into this picture. So they just implemented uh, uh, an online portal uh, where they publish uh, online documents on the history of um, uh, Wiedergutmachung. On the other hand, the finiteness of human life contrasts with the strengthened position of private property as a result of the neoliberal transformation of Eastern Europe. While in the field of compensation, the gradual, uh, gradual end of the surviving generation can be observed, the number of restitution claims by heirs for works of art formerly owned by Jews has increased considerably uh, since the turn of the millennium. A number of spectacular individual cases, and not least the controversy surrounding the so-called Schwabing art find, but also Hollywood films such as Monuments Man, star starring George Clooney, or The Woman in Gold, starring Helen Mirren, have brought the issue of restitution of Nazi looted art into the public eye. This phenomenon was not limited to Germany either, but affected state and private collections throughout Europe. As a rule, such claims were no longer made by the former owners, but by their heirs. If they were successful, they usually resold the artworks immediately, as this involved expensive legal fees. And so some prominent restituted artworks ended up at Sotheby's in London, from where they continued their journey. Well, of course, uh, Sotheby's, in a way, is a, is a metaphor, so for all auction houses. Still. Yeah. I'm just speaking of that. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so, auction houses. While in earlier decades, restitution claims had been justified not least by the importance of the objects in restoring part of a fam family's identity, which was countered by the property interests of the current owners, the situation had now paradoxically reversed. In many cases, it, is, it was now claimed that the artworks in question represented an important element of the respective urban, regional, or even national identity. This was true of Ernst Ludwig Kirchner's Berlin street scene in the Brücke Museum in Berlin and Gustav Klimt's portrait of Adele Bloch-Bauer in the Österreichische Gallery in Vienna. Conversely, 
the Jewish uh, property interests of the, heirs, of the heirs were repeatedly referred to, at least implicitly. This was reinforced by the fact that the practice of art restitution primarily involved U.S. laws, who usually worked on the basis of contingency fees, so that in this dispute a discourse about greedy lawyers was sometimes used to steer up feelings against such restitution. The restitution of so-called Jewish looted art, which remains controversial to this day, also opened the door to a debate about the relationship between restitution and identity that has in recent years extended far beyond the context of Nazi persecution. So this brings me to my last point, an outlook post-colonialism, multidirectional memory and restitution. The turn of the millennium marked the peak of what was probably the last wave of Holocaust reparations. In the meantime, however, the situation has changed considerably. This is most visible in the area of art restitution. While the restitution of looted Jewish art is still work in progress, the debate over the restitution of colonial objects has begun to play an increasingly important role involving all former European colonial powers. These two contexts of confiscations sometimes overlap. In 1934, for example, the art collection of the Jewish newspaper publisher Rudolf Mosse was forcibly auctioned in Berlin, including 11 of the so-called Benin bronzes. Some of these bronzes have since been restituted to their, Jew uh, to their Jewish heirs and are now themselves the subject of post-colonial claim for restitution. Jewish looted art has thus become colonial looted art. This case marks the interconnectedness of the history of confiscation on the one hand and the shift in the historical horizons of interpretation of different contexts of violence on the other. After France initially played a pioneering role in this issue, some German museums have also begun to return colonial objects, including the Benin bronzes from present-day Nigeria, which have become a symbol of colonial looted art. While the restitution of looted Jewish art was based on an individu individualistic concept of ownership, the debate surrounding the restitution of colonial objects in which everyday objects and human remains play an important role alongside art objects is more strongly characterized by a collective concept of ownership. These objects serve above all to reinforce or establish group identities, although there are always disputes about which nations or ethnic groups can make such claims. Moreover, these objects often became anchors of collective identities in the places to which they were brought in the course of colonial appropriation. In 2012, for example, the tabloid, tabloid BZ, uh, whose subtitle reads The Voice of Berlin, ran the headline, quote, Proof, Nefertiti is a Berliner, unquote. The argumentation of the president of the Prussian Cultural Heritage Foundation, Hermann Parzinger, according to which the acquisition of the bust of the Egyptian princess in 1913 was, quote, completely legal according to the laws of the time, unquote, points to the problem of intertemporality how to deal with the tension between contemporary legal consciousness and our contemporary legal and historical sensitivities. That's a huge question. This is all the more difficult because despite all the invocations of a multidirectional memory, I'm quoting Michael Rothberg, we can find a competitive situation between claims related to the Holocaust or Nazi persecution on the one hand and colonial crimes on the other. In the tradition of transitional justice, which emerged in the optimistic climate after the end of the Cold War, German reparations have served above all as a positive role model for the transformation of dict dictatorships into liberal democracies. In the context of the struggle for restorative justice for colonial crimes, on the other hand, German reparations to Israel and the Jews often serve as a negative point of reference, where the allegedly racially motivated discrimination of claims from the colonial context against Jewish Holocaust victims is occasionally asserted.
So while Holocaust reparations are referred to as a model for post-colonial reparations, their rejection occasionally is denounced as a proof of the hypocrisy of liberal reparations. In the German context, the focus is on the 1904 genocide of the Herero and Nama in what was then German Southwest Africa, with the agreement reached in 2021 after years of negotiations with the Namibian government provoking fierce protests from representatives of groups who felt excluded. This points to the fundamental problem of determining which groups can legit legitimately claim reparations unless they are individual victims or their descendants. The future of compensation for historical injustice is therefore at a crossroads. It is too early to say whether reparations and compensation for Nazi injustice will remain a special case that is now gradually becoming a historical issue or whether a new wave of restitution will emerge particularly with regard to the colonial past. The question then will be whether the debate about the specificity of the Holocaust will ultimately result in the related efforts at restitution and compensation remaining a singular event, or whether the lessons learned will be applied to other examples of mass historical violence. The debate on post-colonial reparations goes far beyond looted art. On the one hand, the accusations relate to the events of the colonial era, ranging from looting and slavery to genocide. On the other hand, the allegations relate to the long-term consequences of colonialism, which encompasses almost all, all aspects of global inequalities. They range from inequalities in education, income, and social status, which are regularly found in former colonial states, to the unequal distribution of wealth between the global north and the global south. Even the unequal consequences of climate change, which are more or less indirectly proportional to the causes of pollution, recently have become the subjects of calls for reparations. While the case of the reparation claims for the genocide of the Herero and Nama people still refers to a concrete damage and also to concrete perpetrators, other approaches are even more radical. Namely, the US philosopher Olufemi Otaivo leaves the harm approach or debt approach behind. The demands he outlines in his book, Reconsidering Reparations, published in 2022, are no longer directed against specific perpetrators and no longer seek to compensate specific victims, which is why bilateral negotiation, negotiations can no longer be appropriate. In his constructivist model of reparations, it is thus no longer a matter of restoring a former state of affairs but of first building a better future, taking into account unjust structures that were created by past colonial injustice in the first place. This is where the radical post-colonial utopia of the US philosopher meets the reflections of the French economist Thomas Piketty, who in his book, A Brief History of Equality, published in 2001, raises a quote, plea for change of global wealth distribution, unquote. Piketty ultimately proposes a social democratic redistribution model on a global scale, and by doing so, in a way, he reconciles the old world of Western modernity with the new post-colonial world. Yet the reparative imagination, which had developed in the interwar period and which had aimed at creating a better version of the past, has profoundly changed. In an important book, Samuel Moyne had described human rights as a last utopia in the depressive mood after the end of the American civil rights movement. It is possible that human rights have now been replaced in this role by the demand for reparations, which aims at a better future world radically different from both the past and the present. Such an understanding of reparations no longer aims at the restoration or establishment of a liberal society, but rather at a profound transformation of all kinds of discrimination and inequality, which are widely seen as long-term consequences of colonialism. So history is still seen as a crime story. However, 
with colonialism replacing the Holocaust as the central crime. And the roles in this play have been recast. Western liberalism has moved from the judge's bench to the defendant's bench. It could therefore be, to venture an, an, an unhistorical prediction, that the debate on reparations will be transformed into an instrument of the post-colonial movement in the struggle for a fairer world order, while the Western world that had created the concept turns instead to the search for resilience. The latter attitude, resilience, prepares for future disasters rather than dealing with the consequences of past disasters. In the end, it is the same as it is always with history. It tells us a lot, not only about the past, but above all, about ourselves. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much um, for this very all-encompassing lecture. Thank you all very much for being here, and thank you very much, Hanko Jürgens, for having organized this evening, and also for having organized together the workshop with the young researchers from, we had at least seven countries in the room, researching different aspects of reparation and restitution. Uh, it was a very fruitful day, and I look forward also to engaging with the audience this evening. So we just heard this lecture in uh, chronological order, let's say. I will do the opposite. So I want to start from today, go back to history, and also start posing some questions that we can then uh, tackle together, uh, perhaps also when we start the Q&A. Now, indeed, in recent, tr in recent decades, we are witnessing an interesting trend in the sense that humankind in general seems to be becoming gradually more aware of the fact that the effect of past injustice lingers and that it needs to be addressed. I see this as a prominent trend today, and this is testified, I think, also by the proliferation of requests for reparations from many different groups, from many corners of the world. And I think that this is also a trend that is here to stay. It is one that tells us a lot about the violence of the world of yesterday, but can also perhaps give us some insights about the world of tomorrow. Any conversation of the legacy on, of past injustice and on the possibilities and limitations of repair in the wake of mass atrocities has to start from very bleak considerations. Because the history of humankind is to a very large extent also the history of injustice. Humans have killed, tortured, cheated, enslaved, exploited, dispossessed, and to a disturbing extent, this also is still uh, happening today. But what happens when states or other groups and actors decide to face the legacy of injustice? So what happens when reparations are discussed or negotiated about? Can, how do these programs work? How can they ever actually work? Uh, in my own research, I approached this question, I started thinking about this question when I wrote the history of German-Israeli relations in the aftermath of the Holocaust. And in my work, I looked at East and West Germany and I tried to understand how their very different relationship with Israel then unfolded. And of course, the decision that we just heard about of West Germany to sit down with the representatives of Israel and the claims conference was a very important turning point there. I'm originally from Italy. I used to work in the United Kingdom. And when I moved to the Netherlands, I was very surprised that many of my Dutch colleagues did not know that this meeting took place in the Netherlands, these negotiations and this conversation. So this is why two years ago I organized a conference and an event at the place also to understand and thematize, but why in the Netherlands and what did it mean to host those negotiations there? Why is this not really widely known today? These are also questions that we can pick up uh, later on. Because, of course, it is also in this context that I then became more engaged with the work of Konstantin Goschler, who has written extensively about this problematic of reparations and the history thereof. I think what is also interesting, and it's coming out both from the lecture and from the research, is the existence of different questions of temporalities, different geographies, different vocabulary, and also different functions. Um, I liked your point about um, 
perhaps reparations as last utopia. And I find it also interesting that in a lot of the historiography, uh, if it's not the very specialized works, this element is somehow missing. I find it curious. I find it curious also then in the history of human rights a lot of these turning points are actually not quite there yet. So I wonder also what does it take to integrate or to dialogue between different, let's say, strands of historiography or, or different groups as well. Now, in terms of thinking about turning to the Q&A and also turning to the discussion together, I wanted to um, make two points or ask two questions. The first one is about the paradox that you started from. Um, you started from this paradox of the history of reparation uh, that on the one hand, to the extent that the payments take place, then unfulfilled claims become visible. And I think this is absolutely correct. This made me think about work also of Magdalena Zolkos on restitution and the politics of repair, about restitution as correction and mis direction, repair, but also rupture. And I wonder whether we can also start from there also to have a conversation then with the audience. What is this, what is this paradox about really? What does it tell us? Then there is also something about German history, because of course, a lot of the lecture was on German history. So in a broader sense, I'm thinking also about the titles of some books that have been published in recent years, for example, Learning from the Germans by Susan Niemann or Nyman. Uh, and the question, in the book also mentions reparations, it's not only about it, it's a broader question about the United States dealing with the aftermath of slavery and possible lessons to be learned from German history. But then I think a broad question is, what does it mean to be learning from the Germans? What is the role of German history also in feeding into other debates, other reparation questions as well. Of course, there is also um, the question of the German model, let's say. This is also something that is very prominent today. And while I think that this is all, it's very important to take this with a pinch of salt, I also think that it can be a fruitful point to think about now, not only the course of German history, but also the memory and the memorialization of the German history in other contexts as well. One final point. We heard about, and I also mentioned, very different crimes in the very different groups, very different histories. We also heard about slavery, the environment, the Holocaust. And the question is, what does it mean to have a discussion that connects these different histories of injustice? Are we losing something by doing this or not? And if so, let's have a conversation about it. Thank you very much. So my feeling is that I've been talking for a very long time and uh, you put some very inspiring questions and, and maybe you fired up the audience and they want to respond directly. Of course, I, I could speak for hours and hours on and on. I'm a German professor, but uh, I, I, I'm trying to, to, to hold back. So. Okay, Otherwise, are there any questions? Then... Yes. Ja, hier, alsjeblieft. Ik wil die Nederlandse even vragen. Ja, dat kan, dan gaan we het vertalen. Het onderwerp is duidelijk. Uh, restitutie, reparatie, cultural memory. Maar tegelijkertijd, in mijn hele leven, is in de pers, in de Nederlandse pers vooral heb ik steeds gezien dat er ook op het vlak van het strafrechtelijke zoeken naar uh, gerechtigheid, justice, dat er ook steeds veel aan de hand is. En dat er in die naoorlogse Duitse periode tot, nou wat is het, de jaren zeventig, dat het een verwaarloosde zaak was in Duitsland. Dat er beleid was om daar niet te veel mee te doen. Zo is het op de, dan komt het op, u over. op de gemiddelde krantenlezer ja. overgekomen, hoop ik ja. dan, dat ik dat mag zeggen. En dat het uh, daarna, in een langzame ontwikkeling, een, een momentum heeft gekregen... die uh, ja, vastgelopen is in 
leeftijds, leeftijdsontwikkelingen, uh, uh, grenzen van vervolging die niet meer mogelijk zijn door verjaring in de zin van lichamelijke fitheid van de dader. So it's very interesting question because uh, it's very interesting question because uh, the gentleman says that his imp your impression is that up until the 1970s nothing had happened. Uh, well, we, we talked about these negotiations in Kasteel oud Wassenaar, but it's indeed, I think, from the Dutch perspective, uh, a good approach. Nothing has happened. And then uh, uh, from the 1970s onwards, suddenly, when people were already very old, one could say, or Victor very old, uh, Germany uh, became active on the, uh, on, in this uh, perspective, and that the juridical claims from the, that the, the, the juridical perspective is not discussed enough. Am I right? Did I translate it well? Yeah. This, and what do you mean by that? Yeah. De, 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 de actueelste Nederlandse nazi-jagers. Ja. Yeah. Nu een soort omroepbaas. Uh, Karskens heb ik het over. Er waren maar... some nazi-hunters in the Netherlands, yeah. Maar, maar dat, mis ik, dat mis ik helemaal in het verhaal van de restitution, okay. reparation and cultural memory. Ja. Yeah. Oké. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this great question. Uh, so, the first element... Uh, uh, for, for, so my, my first idea to referring to question is um, we, we need to uh, distinguish bit, between what is going on in politics and also what is going in the legal sphere and what uh, is going on in the public sphere. So and of course we also need to uh, look differently to, to the situations in different countries. And I, I guess that uh, the development in Germany is, is not totally parallel to um, the development in the Netherlands. But I will focus mostly on, on Germany, where I can say um, a lot happened in the late 1940s, since the late 1940s until the mid-60s. But um, this was rather uh, obscure to the German public because this was not a, a, a winning topic for elections. That's the problem. Yeah. So uh, normally, uh, it, so that's basically a problem of democracy. You win democracy by uh, elections by uh, promising people uh, some benefits. And so. Um, the benefits of, of, of German compensation legislation was mostly pensions to uh, Jews living in the United States, German Jewish refugees. So, no voters. And so, uh, the German government did it, but uh, it, nobody spoke about it, because this was not popular. And then, uh, when it came to discussing uh, 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 per perpetrators, uh, Simon Wiesenthal and all these uh, issues, uh, it's not the same thing to blame perpetrators and to claim uh, compensation for the victims. This did not go in parallel. Yeah? So, um, that's an interesting thing. Um, that's, that's a second aspect. And so, uh, in I would say since the 1980s, slowly, it, I would uh, say not, not, not earlier, not in the 1970s, at least in Germany, it was since the 1980s that it started that uh, the public sphere started to push politics into the director, direction of further compensation. But as, as I said before, initially only limited to German groups, German persecuted groups, the forget, forgotten victims. And only after 1990, an international debate started, which now put uh, pressure uh, not only on Germany, but also mostly on uh, Western European countries. So there were campaigns aiming at the Netherlands, France, and so on, and so on. And many of those countries uh, uh, developed um, um, Debates on uh, 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 collaboration yeah? and, and collaborators, and, and so the participation of occupied countries to some degree, you know, uh, in, in the persecution of, of Jews became a, a huge topic in many of these countries. And, and 
po politics reacted and started to develop programs. So uh, we always have to see uh, which side is developing initiative. Is it rather coming from the politics, uh, political sphere? Is it coming from the public sphere? Or also, since the 1990s, from the international legal sphere, especially uh, law courts in the United States. So this is really a complicated system, and it's not very linear, but it's, uh, it's rather back and forth. Okay, I think that's enough for, for the moment. And it's another question, how people in the Netherlands uh, could... Uh, yeah, I think it's working. How people, it's not a question how people in the Netherlands experienced this history, because and I think in a, in a way in the, in the Netherlands this was not very well known, uh, and indeed the Nazi hunters were much more known, and all these discussions, uh, I think. There are many young people in the room, so feel free to ask questions as well. You're somewhat more in the back. Yes. Hi, thank you for the talk and provoking questions. I'm just wondering if any kind of legacy of government in Germany played a role, because after the Second World War, basically, the new government could say, we have nothing to do with the Nazis, right? It was before us, whatever. There is no continuity, and especially as the country was divided, and then reunited again. There, as you mentioned, there were different views on uh, reparations, restitution, etc., etc. So for me, it kind of seemed either it's an influence from outside, so if you want to be a player in this world, you need to comply, or was it coming from the society that it was needed to, or not needed actually, to, to think of this and create reparations. So for me, it's kind of this legacy continuity and maybe in a way social pact. I don't know how to call it better. Thank you for this wonderful question. And uh, well, this leads to another paradox, because uh, there is a common assumption uh, that initially in the West German government there were lots of Nazis, and in the East German government lots of anti-fascists, and speaking to West Germany, of course, there were lots of uh, people with a, some kind of, of, of Nazi past uh, especially in the administration, but also uh, in different governments. So that's the truth. But uh, uh, common wisdom goes that, um, well, these Nazis, these ex-Nazis were against uh, compensation. But uh, the story is more complicated. And uh, so uh, a letter which I, uh, from, uh, uh, from a conversation within uh, the Jewish Claims Conference gave me a clue. So the director of the German branch of the Jewish Claims Conference who wrote regularly to, um, to uh, New York said, well, in the early 1970s, well, times are, are becoming more and more bad, so things are going bad for us. Because the, uh, what is the problem? He said, well, um, now uh, the new generation is coming into office, and they will say, well, we were kids. Before, when we were talking to German uh, politicians or administrators, they they always had some sense of guilt. And it was very easy to deal with them because <laughs> you could get them. And now there's somebody saying, I was a kid, so I'm not affected. It's, uh, so, uh, the, you, you, and so far, it's, it's sometimes more complicated. It's not just uh, Nazi tainted forever Nazi. So uh, guilt is a complicated issue in this story. I, I think you put that too simple. I recently read one of the biographies, the last one, of Fritz Bauer. And if you read that, his work was opposed, interesting enough, from several sides. And especially the, the sphere of old Nazis. Or the fact that the country was infected by Nazism, like this country was infected by anti-Semitism after the war.
Konstantin, of course, the comment is for you, so I will give you the microphone back, but I think this is also a very important point. Like, on the one hand, of course, we have the complexity. On the other hand, we, of course, have the continuity, huh? what you called it, the um, infected by uh, Nazis. And, you know, in, to go back also to the previous question about how does it happen, yeah? What is the, what, how does it start? Where is the pressure coming from? I think it is also important to say that it's fair, it's a fact, that the majority of people in West Germany at the time were, also, were against making reparations or negotiating about reparations or making restitution and similar. This is an important part of the story, of course, and it's also something that you know very well. So I think I want to use this question and this remark about Fritz Bauer, for those of you who don't know it, a very, very important West German jurist who, uh, for example, when uh, got hold of the information about where Adolf Eichmann was, did not share the information with the West German authorities because he knew that if he did, he would disappear probably. So he passed the information on to the Israeli authorities who then uh, extradited him uh, from, from Argentina. Exactly, and was not treated very well indeed in West Germany. Oh, in Israel. Um, no, he wasn't treated so well. It, absolutely, so we know, so leading on to the Eichmann trial and similar. Uh, and uh, so the question of this public opinion element, I think it's also important. It's something that came up also in our workshop uh, uh, earlier today. Um, and yeah, so it's fair to, to, con to thematize this as well. Thank you so much, Lorena, for, for give, also for giving me some time to think about the question. <laughs> so sometimes you need to start with an answer, and you already don't have an answer. But now, by now, I, I got an answer. And uh, well, I, I not only love metaphors, but also paradoxes. And uh, hopefully, you will be will like my paradoxes more than my metaphors. So uh, the the paradox is that. You're absolutely right, yeah? what you're uh, saying about Fritz Bauer and who uh, who's, who's once said, so when I leave my office, I, I, I enter a hostile country. Yeah? And so th th this was quite serious. But I think the paradox is that uh, it were the same people who tried to, uh, who were against him and to try to prevent him from making legal uh, trials against perpetrators and who were somehow inclined to support uh, um, uh, compensation, namely uh, Globke, who has become this symbol at all. So Globke was uh, very much interested that Eichmann... Uh, Introduce Globke, sorry. Uh, okay. Yeah. Hans Globke was the Secretary of State uh, of, of, of Konrad Adenau, and he was the most important uh, man next to Adenau because he was responsible for the whole selection of, of leading personnel in the Federal Republic. And he was uh, the author of the, comment, of the command, of the legal command of the Nuremberg Laws in the, in, in the Third Reich. And so... Uh, he, is, he has become the symbol of continuity from uh, the Nazi bureaucracy to the bureaucracy of the Federal Republic. And at the same time, he was trying uh, to uh, reduce the damage uh, for the reputation of the Federal Republic uh, po potentially resulting out of the Eichmann tri trial. And um, he was especially afraid that Eichmann might use his knowledge and blame him for his participation in the persecution of Jews. So uh, uh, Globke had a clear interest in this case. At the same time, he was... Um, he was mentioned at, at, at one of those persons who was the most positive for uh, compensation for Jews. So it was, in, in a way, it belonged together. So the aim uh, to get, uh, well, to... Um, Would you explain to, this paradox? Yeah, the, I was just about to do. Okay. So the paradox Thanks. is, uh, the German interest was uh, to, to, to improve its reputation 
And to improve the reputation, it was important that not too many scandals about perpetrators would be, uh, be um, uh, uh, go around in the public. So uh, uh, something like the Eichmann trial was obviously a disaster for German reputation. And at the same time, uh, paying compensation was also good for the reputation. So this, this was not a contradiction. So these were two sides uh, of the same politics. In your, in your lecture, you mentioned that in the 19, uh, let me just check, 1980s, that there was a shift towards the suffering of the victims. And I was wondering what caused that, and if you could elaborate on that development. Oh, thank you for giving me the opportunity. So I, I, I can understand that this was not easy to, to get uh, the, the, the point. Uh, so my, my, my point is... Um, when the process started in the 1950s, it was very much in the spirit of, uh, of civil law. So there was a damage, and we need to pay for the damage. And the damage was measured according, well, to the material value, either uh, the material value of objects or also um, uh, it, uh, the other me measure stick was uh, um, how much you could earn personally. And so it was, a, a, there, there was a hierarchy, so those who were better off became more than those who were not so, so good. And then uh, changing to suffering uh, uh, st uh, ends this kind of differentiation. Because suffering, every human being suffers the same way. You cannot say, uh, because he's a rich man, he will suffer more than a poor man. Uh, this, is, this is absurd. So this shifted... Uh, uh, the, the taxonomy of the taxonomy of of how to measure uh, what has happened to the people, yeah? and so the question is, how did this come about? Yeah? And I think this is a a, a discursive phen phenomenon which started in the United States in uh, in the context of the civil rights movement. So so very often you can find that new developments somehow start in, in the U.S. and it takes about ten years and then they will arrive in in, in Germany. And so it's a discourse about um, recognition and suffering, and it's still very popular to. Today, so for us, it appears normal. We think, of course, it's about suffering, it's about recognition. But uh, as a historian, I, I will always ask, okay, when did it start that we uh, think this is the normal way to look at things? And so in, in the 1950s or 1960s, people were not talking about suffering and recognition, so they, they, they had other uh, categories. Yeah? So that's the point. Yeah. Thank you. What can we learn from the past what happened today in the world? Can uh, we I, learn from the past what happened today? Oh, big question. Well, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of, uh, of, of, sim, of lessons and legacies. It's, it's not so... Uh, there are some things where you where you can't learn anything. I would say you, you cannot learn anything from the Holocaust except that people can be unbelievable true. But it's not because of the Holocaust we can learn this and that. But, we still, but what we can learn is uh, um, that the way we look at things is not natural. And I think what I just tried to do is a good example. We can learn that the categories or the... Uh, or, or, or our choices of relevance. Uh, what, what do we think, what is important, uh, what's going on around, and, and how do we label it? Uh, this is changing. And if we understand that the way we are looking at the world and uh, we are looking at ourselves is not just a given thing, it's not just natural, um, uh, we can consider our world and our situation as, as more fluid. And this May, might give us some agency. So we, we won't, maybe it helps us not seeing things just like inevitable, as things must be the ways they are. So because if we understand that uh, things always change and the way we look at uh, things changes, and maybe the way we look at, the, at things and at the world might help to change the world, 
I think that's a kind of optimistic lesson, so, but that's all I can give to you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I want to come back to this question, why did the shift to suffering happen? So on the one hand, we had, of course, the civil rights movement in the U.S., but on the other hand, we had here the trauma discourse, you know, this medical uh, profession was radicalized, uh, trauma, the PTSD as a symptom got a name, and when you have a name, then suddenly you also see something. So I think this happened parallel in society, so I wonder how this on the one hand, the medical frame is, of course, individual, individualization of pain. So it's the problem is with the person. Then you have it where you see it as a group phenomenon as well. But this is a little bit the opposite of making claims for rights, you know, uh, putting agency forefront. So I wonder how these two movements or discoveries at the very same place, how they relate to each other. Oh, thank you so so much uh, for this intervention. Of course, that's uh, very important, and, and of course, these things belong together. But s let's start with the trauma discourse. So, um, you, you you need to know uh, if some, let's say, some survivor from a, from a concentration camp would uh, claim compensation, and, and he would get a, a medical examination. Uh, medical doctors in the 1950s would. Uh, will look at him and say, or her, and say, well, maybe uh, this is an inherited disease. And uh, normally, um, if, uh, if uh, the impact is away, people will be healthy again. And if the impact doesn't go away, probably it's inherited. And so this was a, obviously uh, quite... Uh, a negative effect uh, of the medical examinations. And then uh, this slowly changed, so, uh, and, and the trauma discourse um, helped very much to this because, as Nicole right, uh, rightly uh, stated, um, we ca uh, concepts make us see things differently. So it's, it makes a difference if we say, well, there are 100 trees, or if we say there's a forest. Um, suddenly there's a concept and we see the trees different, differently. And it makes a difference if we say uh, a person suffers from this and this and this and this, or if we say, ah, this is a trauma and uh, this is a category which is an officially manual, a medical manual. And suddenly uh, doctors can diagnose uh, a particular disease and, and, they can, and you can get a treatment for this. And it's an interesting... And, so the question is why the trauma discourse, it started paradoxically for, uh, with the Vietnam War. And um, so you might expect, okay, Vietnam War, napalm bombings. So no, the problem was the American soldiers who came back. And so they had strange symptoms and uh, the medical profession didn't have any category for these symptoms. And then they uh, it created a new category, which was the trauma. And so this was, uh, so the idea was they are coming home from war and they are no longer um, affected by the war, but still the symptoms of, of somebody who suffers from, all, uh, uh, from, from war are still there. Why? This was something which uh, one couldn't explain at that time. And then one realized that even when uh, the negative impacts are, are gone, people still can suffer from that. And this is a totally new idea that has been, was a totally new idea at that time. For us, it seems as totally normal, but we need to understand uh, there were times and, uh, until the 1960s, 70s, when this was not considered as normal. So this was a kind of, of medical revolution. And since uh, the trauma discourse uh, had been established in the medical profession, it spread out. And it's similar like restitution. Today, uh, trauma is, so to speak, ubiquitous. It, you can find trauma in, in all, everywhere. Yeah? But the role of the victims themselves who were traumatized yeah. is also very important because many of these victims couldn't talk about their trauma. And I think somewhere 30 or 40 years after the Second War, mm -hmm. some of them retired, started to look back uh, mm -hmm. to their lives and started to talk. Yeah. So. so that, this, uh, this brings me back to what, what uh, Nicole said. So it, it's also, uh, it's, it's not 
so to speak, normal that uh, uh, the victims speak or, or, the, or that, that they are heard. So uh, there was also a shift in the role in the victim, and it was also a shift in, in that sense that being a victim was an element of empowerment, and this was something new. And all these things came together. So the trauma as a concept which explained the, the long-lasting effects of persecution, uh, the empowerment of the victim, and also the, uh, the new idea that being a victim entitles you to something. So uh, the victim status uh, uh, gives you a, a political claim, which, which was which started not with, with Holocaust victims. This started rather uh, in the context of the civil society. Um, yeah. civil, um, not all victims would, yeah. would experience it yeah. this way, I think. Pardon? Not all victims would experience it this way, no, giving the, a claim, because no, many the, victims the, were no, only... No, this is not uh, uh, the, hurt, the experience so of all victims, but yeah. this was, uh, so to speak, a concept which, uh, which could be used. And, yeah, of concept, course, yeah. uh, not... It, this was not a natural thing that suddenly all victims said, hey, I'm entitled uh, no, to all. some, some yeah. political claims. But there were, uh, it, it's not always only the victims who are speaking for the victims. Uh, that's, that's another thing. So there are, uh, there are political groups who speak for victims. And they m might use this concept, and, and they have done this in many cases, that, are, that they are saying, we are speaking for the victims, and we are putting forward political claims for recognition of these victims. So th that's another complicated issue. Who actually is speaking for the victims? Are the victims speaking themselves, or are there some uh, speakers who are entitled or feel entitled to speak for the victims, and this is especially true when, uh, when no more victims are alive. So in, in the case of the Nama and Herero, there are no personal victims any longer after 130 years. But there are still uh, some who are claiming we are speaking for the victims. So it's a complicated thing. And you, just a yes, small sure. Point. I have very small points because I think it's, a, it's an important, let's say, uh, dimension of how the understanding of trauma changes. And just as a very small um, comment, um, the, especially the new words and the new terms and vocabulary is, that you talked about is related to the post-traumatic stress disorder. This is the new element because, of course, the understanding of trauma comes from much earlier in the 20th century and, and Sigmund Freud, who at that time does not even define what a traumatic event is because, the, because things will be different for different human beings. But then, of course, the knowledge changes, and you're absolutely right that then also the conflict in Vietnam, in that sense, plays a very important role to define these categories, so post-traumatic stress disorder. And I think the Holocaust is a pretty good example of traumatic experience. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. But the, but the concept of trauma predates it. And so you see these different, let's say, chronologies, terminologies, the, the advancement in the medical profession as well of understanding of what these events do. And also to go back to Nicole Imler's work, which is also about, does a lot on transgenerational uh, effects and memory and, and so on. I think this is also an important element to define there and to mention. So we should... Stop, but we, I saw s some questions still. If you really want to react on the discussion, yeah. Thank you for that second question after mine, because I was thinking in, indeed on the rise of, of tra uh, therapy, actually, the, the ubiquitousness of therapy from like the 1970s onward. You have shell shock people in the, from the First World War. So how, how much does it relate to this general therapy in total, which is back to the psychiatrist, but it's much broader, of course, with Sigmund Freud and you know, humanist and all Skinner, and you can go on and on. So therapy has a, maybe a, a much wider role to play here than people realize, and it's back to German language, Sigmund well, Freud amongst others. Well, if you could look at uh, World War One and shell shocked people, the reaction of the medical profession was uh, negative. They, uh, their intention was to prevent these people to to get pensions. So uh, there was not just shell shock; there was also the term of rentneurose, a pension neurosis. Uh, 
Yeah? And this was the tradition. And this was the tradition against which uh, uh, the claim for uh, uh, compensation for Nazi victims was fighting. And this took some time. And to, uh, I, I hope that I won't be misunderstood. I'm, I'm not saying, well, uh, um, if, if, so the problem is we always need to label uh, things and labels change. And it, uh, so there were times when there was uh, no usage of the term Holocaust. And this doesn't mean that the things to which the term Holocaust did not have uh, taken place, of course they took place, but the way people discussed them and described them changed and the concept changed. And, uh, and, so the, uh, and with changing concepts like um, Holocaust or trauma, also the way these issues were debated changed. That's what I want to say. I'm, I'm not denying the, the reality which is behind the history. This didn't change. But the way that people described this reality changed. And this had some effect. So because it makes a difference if you say, well, this is a pension neurosis or this is a trauma. Uh, I've, I've got two questions and then we stop. At least, I don't know if you have a question but that can be the last one. Yeah. <laughs> Wat ik wil zeggen, kun jij ook zeggen. But you can talk in Now, English. In the, in the Netherlands, there's a clear example. And I remember myself how upset I was when the word Holocaust started to come in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think even at the time of uh, Jacques Presse and, and Lou de Jong, in the 60s, one talked about the Jodenvervolging. Mm -hmm. And then came the Holocaust, and then the Shoah. And then in, in Israel, they forgot to speak about the Churban, which was the real word in Hebrew. Last question in Dutch again, or? I can go also try in English. <laughs> um, But wait for the microphone. Two remarks more. There, is, there was a documentary on Dutch television uh, about uh, the, the awareness in Germany our days. The name was for a Dutch documentary, Alles wieder gut. So a Dutch documentary with the title, Alles wieder gut. It was made by Ruben Gischler for the Joodse Omroep, part of the Evangelische Omroep in our days. And uh, this documentary is very interesting for to search the awareness under the general Dutch public, the younger people, the students and the s people on the, on the secondary schools and uh, at the memory sites, etc. It's a very, very nice documentary. The other thing I want to, to ask, um, are we aware about what the American pressure did by coming to a better restitution and reparation and cultural memory. Uh, probably we are forgotten, but it was under President Bush, the father, father Bush, that uh, uh, under, Secretary, uh, under Secretary of State, Lawrence Eagleburger, that he uh, uh, was taking the, the job by the president asking to do that, and he said, I will do it, but please give me also the possibilities to put pressure on the European institutions, finally now to pay back all the money and all the other values, material values, which are in the banks, in the uh, secure, uh, assur assur uh, assurance companies, etc. And it happened. It happened. I myself, I had a, a, a claim on the, the Dutch program, Maror money. I had also a claim on the Austrian uh, state and both of these possibilities are shaped by the American power. And you mentioned, uh, Herr Goschler, you, you, you mentioned at the, at the start of your uh, lecture what the American uh, uh, politics did in reverse to the German politics, the collective and the individual things. I saw you, your fingers crossed at that moment. So. That is my plea, to be aware what the American power has done well in this aspect. Are you very grateful to the Americans? I am. Yes. In this aspect. <laughs> okay. So, in a way, this was more of a comment, but maybe to the second comment, uh, 
I could add uh, absolutely. So, uh, and I would add more. Uh, so, uh, the Americans really were using their power in a very smart way, because uh, they never used it in the sense of direct pressure. So, but it was more like a show of force, because it was a, they had to keep a delicate balance, because they were always thinking to a situation after the First World War, where they were first enforcing a high level of reparations, and in the end they had to deliver the credits to the Germans so that they could pay the reparations. And uh, the Germans always, in, in, in different, uh, several uh, situations, tried to play this card again and said, OK, if you are pressing us for reparations, please give us the money, at least in the 1950s. And so uh, the, uh, the, the United States was always carefully using their pressure so that it, uh, they were saying, well, they need to be able themselves to pay. So uh, we, we don't want to carry their burden. So it's a delicate story. So thank you very much, everybody, also for giving the Dutch perspective on the ways of restitution and reparation. Thanks to you, Konstantin Gosler and Lorena De Vita, for a very long day with very interesting new insights. And thank you all. Uh, good night.